Hello everyone, I'm Danny Campbell, senior pastor here at the Tabernacle. Our service will begin in just a moment, but I want to take a moment to personally thank you for tuning in. Your time and attention are very much appreciated. I also want to personally invite you to come and visit us for our in-person 1015 worship service, the one that's about to begin, as well as our other on-campus services and activities throughout the week. We believe that nothing can take the place of in-person corporate worship and the gathering of believers. So if you're a member of the Tabernacle watching online, we welcome you back. And for those watching who are not members of any church, we encourage you to follow the Lord's leading in finding a church family, hopefully here at the Tabernacle. In the absence of being able to come physically, we're so delighted that you've joined us online and so thankful for the technology that allows us to provide this service. You can find more information about service and activity times, information about how to become a member, as well as a host of other things by checking out the website at www.thetabernaclefamily.org. Our service is about to begin, so I encourage you to use this remaining time to remove anything that may distract you, pick up your Bible, and pray that the Lord would speak to you during this service. Thank you, and God bless.
to know that the altar is still open. The altar is still open, which means the mission still remains. And what a precious privilege it is for us to be a part of that mission, to make known to the ends of the earth that there is a God in heaven who loves his creation so much that he sent his only son, that they would trust in him, they would have eternal life. Brothers and sisters, he is mighty to save, amen? So let's, if you would, stand with me and sing about it. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. Heroes and My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, heroes and conquer the grave, Jesus conquer the grave, Savior, He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save.
shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be thy parting cry, my heart shall raise. This hill its prayer shall be singing to start us out with there and uh, singing about the Lord being risen made me think Easter's coming up and he is risen risen and that's what we'll say when Easter comes Uh, let's practice once again he is risen risen praise the Lord well we are so glad that you're here today and uh, we have a special treat in the next few minutes let me ask Brent George to come on up here Brent's here with his wife Sarah and his kids, uh, Noah, Danae, Bethany, and Justin are all there too. And they are our missionaries in Romania. We heard a great report from them in the Sunday School Hour. And Brent's going to share with us a few minutes now. And I especially love the fact, having gone on a couple of previous mission trips to Romania, the work they're doing there among the gypsies and going into some of those Roma villages. And Brent, it's such a pleasure to have you here, brother. Thank you. Well, it's really good to be here again. Uh, it's been uh, probably five years, I think, since we've been here. And so just thankful to have the opportunity to come and, and uh, give a quick update. Um, I want to start by reading a verse out of Titus, kind of a verse that's been important to our family, important to our ministry. Titus 1, 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Love that verse. One of my favorite verses. Because when you you sit there and you think about it, so God promised that he was going to save us before the world even began. That means before God created you, he already knew that you were going to sin. He already knew that you were going to rebel against him, but he created you anyway. That's love. And so he created you knowing that you were going to sin, but knowing that he was going to make a way for you to have eternal life with him. Now, our work is with the gypsy people, mostly in Romania, for the last uh, six or seven years. We've been there for 13 years, but most, are, most recently we've been working with the gypsy people. And the gypsy people are a hated and rejected people. And so for them to hear that there is a creator God that loves them and wants a personal relationship with them, that is an amazing message for those people. And so for the last several years, we've had the the privilege of going to several villages in northwest Romania and letting the gypsy people know that this creator God does exist and he did die for them and he does want to save them. Uh, When we first got to Romania, many of you perhaps remember, we went to work with a ministry that was already established there. And in that ministry, there was a big summer camp ministry, and there was a Bible Institute. Now, I was teaching at the Bible Institute, and uh, we were planting churches as a team during those first five or six years. But what I really wanted to do was to work with nationals, help graduates of our Bible Institute to go out and plant churches. And so after those first five or six years, I teamed up with Mircea, which is one of the gypsy students that was at our Bible Institute, and he and I began planting churches together. So the main church that we have now is in Medieshu Aurit. Medieshu Aurit is Mircea's home, home village, where he grew up, where his family is, and we have a church there. The church is going well. We thank the Lord for the way people are growing. Uh, we have probably around 40 people, I would say, on a normal service. Um, People are growing spiritually. Uh, uh, People that had grown up in other churches uh, have come to me and say, you know, since the last year I've been going to this church, the last two years I've been going to this church, I've learned more, I've grown more than I did in the 30 years up until now. And so it's exciting to see the way God is is teaching these people and helping them to grow in their spiritual lives. Uh, Just within the last few weeks, uh, they had a... uh, while I was here, the guys that are still back there, they did a big evangelistic outreach and a concert and stuff at the church. And uh, in our church that fits 100 people, we had about 250 people come to the service. And we saw several people saved. And uh, a couple of weeks later, six people were baptized there in that church, in that village. Um, while I've been gone, uh, even as that church continues to grow, uh, the men from that village are going out to these other villages where we have planted churches. 
the main one that we've planted is, is in Tudalung. It's about 20 minutes away from Mediesh. And uh, again, we're seeing people saved, seeing people baptized, seeing people grow spiritually. We have one man in that village who right now is, uh, uh, he's had his son teaching him how to read. He wants to learn how to read because he now wants to be a preacher. And so he wants to learn to read so he can study his Bible so he can be a preacher right there in his own village. Uh, another, vi another village is Palm. Uh, it's about an hour away from Mediesh. We planted a church there in Palm. Uh, it was kind of difficult to get to. Uh, there's a, they call it a, a ferry. I don't know if it's really a ferry. It's kind of a piece of wood that you drive on and they use a rope to pull you across the river. Uh, but we had to do that every week. It was tough getting to Palm. Uh, so once people were saved and ready to be baptized there, uh, we handed that church off to a national church that wasn't too far down the road from them. And so I'm still able to keep in contact with them to see how they're doing. We're not really involved there, but we're thankful that they are continuing to grow and, uh, and expand in that ministry. So right now we're trying to plant a, a fourth church in the village of Dorotz, which is right on the Hungarian border. And uh, the Lord is really working there also. Uh, one of the men from that village called a few weeks ago and said that he personally went and talked to the mayor of the village and convinced the mayor to donate a piece of land where we can build a church. And so we're hoping that uh, this summer when I get back, we'll be able to build a church right there in the fourth village. So the Lord is working and we're thankful for what he's doing. We're thankful for the part that you've had in that. Uh, I've been asked several times about COVID and how, how uh, 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 the ministry has, has been able to survive during COVID. And we're thankful for that, that even during this time, the Lord is continuing to work. Uh, I told a story in Sunday school about how um, the laws changed where we were not allowed to meet in our building when COVID first started. And so uh, we began holding church services out in our courtyard. Every Sunday we'd haul all the chairs out, we'd have church, and then we'd put the chairs away. And then they changed the law and said, you can't, you can't have church in your courtyard anymore. We weren't allowed to gather groups together, even if it was outdoors. So I so, said, well, what are we going to do? So we went and talked to the mayor and the local police, and we said, okay, we understand that we can't gather for church services. So we had this plan. We said, okay, we're going we're gonna to just put our speakers out on the sidewalk right in the middle of the village. And uh, the village is basically just one street. And so we start singing songs, we start preaching, and everybody just came outside and sat on the sidewalk in front of their house. So the police would come by, and there was nothing they could do. They didn't even care. They thought it was funny. They'd smile and wave and drive away. Because we weren't gathering everybody for church, we were just doing church on the sidewalk. And uh, so I had five girls come before Easter, a couple weeks before Easter, and say, we want to be baptized. I said, okay, later. They said, no, we want to be baptized on Easter. I said, well, we're not going to be able to get back in our building unless the laws change really quick. They said, they don't care. They want to be baptized on Easter. So we put our bathtub out in the middle of the street, and we filled it with water, and we had a baptismal service right there in the middle of the street. So uh, creativity, I guess that's the, the way to survive during COVID. Uh, but the Lord has continued to work even during these times of COVID. Um, when we head back to Romania, uh, we've, we've been traveling for, for three months. We have three more months of traveling around the U.S. before we get back to Romania. Uh, we're looking, back, looking forward to getting back to our church family over there. Uh, they really have become like family to us. Um, our, our youngest child calls one of the ladies uh, the Romanian word for grandma, or actually the Hungarian word for grandma over there. Uh, we're very close to the people. We miss them and we love them and we're looking forward to getting back to them. Uh, but... What is the reason why we are traveling around for these six months? Because we are wanting to visit churches just like yours that have been supporting us faithfully for so many years. Your church has been support, supporting us almost exactly 13 years now. And uh, the churches that we plant, the, the camps that we do during the summer, the different outreaches that we do, we can't do those if we don't have churches that are willing to support us uh, in the work that we're trying to do. And so we want to thank you for what you've done. We want to give you an update and say, look, this is what God is doing through us. This is what God is going to put fruit to your account because of the part that you've had in the ministry that is going over there, over there in Romania. Uh, we have got a table set out uh, right out these doors, a table set up out there, and uh, feel free to come by after the service. I'd love to get a chance to meet some of you or to, to renew friendships, get a chance to talk to you, answer any questions that you have about our family, about the ministry. Uh, we also have prayer cards back there. 
uh, we've got lots. I encourage you to come back, take a prayer card so that you'll, uh, you'll remember to pray for us. So many of you already this morning have come up and said, look, it's great to, to get to see you. We've been praying you, for you for so long. We appreciate the prayer. We pr appreciate the financial support. And we hope that we can continue to have a great relationship for years to come. Thank you. And be sure and add to your prayers for them that where they live is not too far from the Ukrainian border. And so as they go back, undoubtedly some of their ministry will be helping minister to refugees and others. And we'll pray that the uh, conflict stops and doesn't spread to more of uh, Eastern Europe there. Uh, boy, what a great report. And just love you guys. And uh, so thankful for the partnership and Nehemiah 7 and Gary Reynolds getting us connected with them. Let's take a moment or two just to look in your bulletin if you would. And as you open it up in that left column, I want to highlight all four of the things below where I put that word in the note from Dr. Campbell. And the first one is there related to Bible school, Vacation Bible School this summer. There's your dates, June 20th through 24th during the day. And we're so glad to be able to have it, a full-blown Bible school again this year. And there's also an insert that gives you the registration form. And we need you to go ahead and register your kids for Bible school and pass that along to others that would. Uh, we will take others as the months unfold, but to guarantee that you get a shirt that's in the right size, uh, you need to go ahead and pre-register, and so please do that. Then you look, it says a look inside there. On April 24th, we're going to take the time in the service to celebrate what the tabernacle does in ministry together as a church family. And so I'm looking so forward to that Sunday morning service and doing that that day. And then we're inviting everyone who's here to stay uh, for lunch on the grounds after that. And that's what we need you to sign up for at the Opportunity Desk. And we'll, uh, you sign up, and then what we're going to have is we're going to, um, that day, uh, assist you in sitting as families with your deacon uh, that day. So you say, I'm not sure who my deacon is. That's okay. You sign up over there, and that day we'll get you to the tables where your deacon and the ones there are sitting so he can get to know you uh, that day. So the look inside. And then you see this uh, word on the fly leaf there that you can fill in. We just talked to her at a great testimony of baptism. The next time we baptize is going to be the Sunday after Easter. And if you're interested in being baptized in profession of your faith uh, publicly, uh, see me about that or fill this out and we'll talk to you about that day coming up. That's the next time we're going to baptize. Now, you see this note here that says Jesus the teacher. It's below in that uh, inside column there. Jesus the Teacher, Dinner and Show, May 14th, 2022, and that's uh, in the Charlotte area. One of our, well, let me just uh, have this. If you are under the age of 40, uh, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're under the age of 40. That's awesome, so many of you out there. I just want to tell you what kind of church you're at, you know, the Tabernacle family is. Brenda Henderson, um, one of our dear senior saints, has actually been relocated to an assisted living facility near her children in Charlotte. But your Tabernacle family doesn't forget you. We keep praying for you, loving you, and writing you cards and things like that. This trip to this Caraway uh, Productions uh, that's so good, Jesus the Teacher down there, for the 20 that go, you'll be joined by Brenda Henderson and her daughter that, that uh, day. And we've specifically chosen uh, that day so that we could be a blessing to her, but also see this event. And so that you can also sign up for over here. But we've only booked 20 places. But that's the kind of church you're a part of. And praise the Lord for it. Uh, great ministry to children and youth, but never forgotten all the way up. And we're so thankful for uh, the ministries we have. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we go to prayer, we remember the family of uh, Joan Sutton. As dear Joan went to be with Jesus this past week, reunited with Ben and all the ones that they ministered to along the way that are already there. And we pray you'd come alongside that family and comfort them now. Thank you for Joan's legacy in our church, Lord, and how what an encouragement she was as a pastor's wife to Elizabeth and and uh, as a pastor uh, to me, she just uh, was such an encouragement. And thank you for, we miss her dearly already. Lord, we thank you for the way you've been meeting people in their grief. Many of our folks have lost someone this past week or in the last month or so, Lord God. And we pray that you'd minister to everyone who's grieving. 
we thank you for the opportunities that are before us here locally and around the world to share the gospel and to be partners, to have rich partnerships with folks just like the Georges, Lord God. Thank you for calling them to Romania, the good work they're doing, the churches that are planted and how uh, the work is going on even now in their absence, Lord God. And I do pray that during this time, as Brent and Sarah seek your face, God, that even as they go back, you'll just uh, give them your peace and guidance concerning the exact ways you want to have them continue to evangelize and, and disciple and build up the church there, God. We do pray for this great vision they have of uh, putting together a camp that would be a first flight camp for folks to come to, God, and minister to all the more. We pray you'd provide the funds and the workers, Lord God, and that it would all come together. And we do pray for the Ukraine right now, Lord, next door to Romania and the things that those folks are undergoing. We do pray for a protection. We pray that uh, Russia will not be able to subdue the entire company. We thank you for the country. We pray that you'd continue to bless the believers there and those that are there and those who have gone several million already to other countries, Lord God. We pray that in Romania and the other countries they'd find relief and that those that don't know the Lord, this would be the time that they hear the gospel. And Lord, we pray that you protect their family members back in the Ukraine. We pray for a change of heart within Russia's leadership and for the Christians that are there, God, many of them deeply embarrassed by this that's going on, Lord God. We pray that you'd minister to them. And Lord, we pray that you'd be the guest of honor in this service now as we continue on. We praise you, we love you, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Stand with me as we continue to worship the Lord in song. I sang this uh, a couple of weeks ago as an introduction. We're going to be doing some new songs uh, over the next uh, several weeks. And so uh, forever we'll sing your praise. What an awesome privilege to know that um, we get to praise and worship the Lord forever and ever and ever. I say this often, it may be easy for me to get excited about singing forever and ever and ever, um, but it's true. If you don't like singing, uh, heaven's going to be really rough, um, you know? <laughs> um, what a good God we serve. Isn't it awesome to know he's not only at work here in the tabernacle, but then the tabernacle links all the way to Eastern Europe, and he's at work there. And even in the conflict in Ukraine, he's at work there and in China, all around the globe, Africa, South America. What a good God we serve forever and ever and ever. He's worthy of our praise. Let's do it together. joy who is able to keep us from falling let the nations declare your fame as we lift up the name of Jesus sing it holy holy Stay close. 
people said. Amen. You may be seated. Are you past the point of weary is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. about me let me tell you about my Jesus oh. he makes a way
Amen. Whoo. Amen. Well, open up your Bibles uh, to the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 14. Uh, if you're newer to your Bible, I'm going to go over some verses before we get to the book of Revelation. And if you're newer to your Bible, you may want to go to the beginning of your Bible to your table of contents because I am going to turn us a couple places before we get to the book of Revelation. And the table of contents will show you where those books are. Uh, but I, I also want to say thank you to Eddie. Eddie, I, that's, that song we sang just before Elizabeth sang there, you wrote that, didn't you? Okay, so praise the Lord. So that's something not being sang anywhere else. You guys are getting to sing it here. Uh, and uh, praise the Lord for uh, the gifts and talents he gives to God's people. Well, Revelation is full of references of the uh, activity of angels. And the verses we'll look at today in chapter 14 of Revelation contain one of my favorite references in all the scriptures to what an angel is going to do uh, a little bit before the second coming of Jesus Christ. But by way of introduction to our text, I thought I'd first have us look at some of the other wonderful verses in the Bible about angels and angelic activity. And uh, you might have others that, are, that, that I miss in this that are favorites to you. And at lunchtime, go ahead and share. I really liked this one that Pastor Danny shared, or here's one that he didn't put in but means a lot uh, to me. So angels are all about glorifying God. And we just sang a song with those words, holy, 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 in it. And uh, in Isaiah 6, the winged seraphim, Angels are shown constantly praising God in heaven. Isaiah 6, 3 says, And one seraphim cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so heaven is filled with angelic songs. And we've seen some of that as we've gone into the book of Revelation. But we're told the angels actually sang at creation when God was creating. In Job 38, verses 4 and 7, God asks Job, first of all, you know, Job said, like some of you, I've got some questions to ask God. And then God shows up and asks Job about a hundred questions in a row. And Job says, never mind. I got it. You're God and I'm not, you know, and so I'll praise you no matter what. So when you think of the questions you have for God, remember he's got some questions for you. Here's one he asked Job. He said, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, can't you see them? Let there be light and they're singing as the light comes. And let there be this vegetation and they're singing as the vegetation grows in the trees and all those different things. And then as the uh, fish and the fowl and the animals came and then on day six, the creation of humans created in the image and likeness of God, male and female. And they were singing during creation week. When humans are born, we have evidence that we get a guardian angel. What do, they, what do guardians do? They guard and protect, right? And in Genesis 3, we read that cherub angels were posted by God to guard the way to the Garden of Eden, lest in our sinful estate we got back to that tree and were able to grab it and live forever like those twisted folks in Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, uh, forever life in a sinful condition. So God said, I can't let that happen. And he guarded the way. But Jesus told us they guard humans too. So Matthew 18, verses 10 and 11, he said, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And so I think about how angels can go through that thin veil that separates here and spiritual reality just beyond this physical. And they can go back and forth. They can see the Father and then come right in and minister to those that are their charge. I read recently that scientists now say that at the moment of human conception, there's a flash of light that happens. It's one of the craziest things. You can actually go on YouTube and find the video of them saying this is when the egg meets the sperm and boom, there's light all of a sudden. I wonder if that's the angel arriving to protect their charge. As human life goes on, we're told that angels continue to minister to people. Here's what Hebrews 1.14 says. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? And so one thing we might get to do in heaven and later on a new earth is talk to our guardian angels and hear about the ways that they protected us and guided us, keeping us for that time where we'd hear the gospel and respond. They protect us and minister to us before and after we come to know Christ. We're also told they engage in spiritual warfare on behalf of God and his saints. Turn to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6. 
So you got 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. Chapter 6. And in this... In these verses, uh, the prophet Elisha and his servant were surrounded by enemy forces and all the servant could look out and see is the doom that awaited them as the jig was up. They were going to get caught and uh, maybe killed and stuff like that. And uh, so verse 14 says, Therefore, this is the king of Syria, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there and they came by night and surrounded the city. And verse 15 says, And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to Elisha, Alas, my master, what shall we do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Like Barney Fife says to Andy, right? What are we going to do? Verse 16, So Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now before the next verse, can't you imagine the servant go and say what? We're surrounded by the enemy. I can see them. And you're talking about there's more of us with us and helping us than there are with them. And Elisha, you know, the sigh that only the man of God, the prophet, can give. (sighs) So he answered, do not fear. For those who are with us more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. There's that light again. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Powerful, powerful verses about God protecting his people. And as servants of God, we're immortal until it's our time to go be with the Father in heaven. And so uh, that protection is there even when we can't see it. Wouldn't it be awesome if our eyes could be open right now and see all that that happening before us? Now, we are not to pray to angels to help us, but when we pray, God dispatches his angels to help us or those we are praying for. And many times in the scriptures, angels delivered messages to God's people. So turn to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. There's so much happening in the book of Daniel that this is often missed, but it's such a tremendous uh, insight into prayer. So now you're going to the prophets as you turn your Bible's pages, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. And we're going to chapter 10. And we're going to look at verses 10 through 14. Now, Daniel, we read in chapter 10, the first few verses, had been in prayer and fasting. It had been 21 days since he'd eaten anything. He was in mourning for different things, but he also uh, turned that into prayer uh, time. And it reads in verse 10, Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved. That's great, isn't it? First thing he communicates is, heaven loves you. God loves you. You're greatly loved. Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Verse 12, then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Where were they heard? They were heard in heaven. God hears prayers. And I have come because of your word. So Daniel prayed. The angelic act help was on the way. And the, he was going to get uh, some words that would help us even to this day understand some of prophecy. And it says there in verse 13, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Not the physical king, the spiritual uh, demonic activity, those principalities that Ephesians 6 talks about. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes with a great archangel, Michael actually went and helped Daniel or helped this angel Uh, fight off the king of Persia, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I've come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. So behind the scenes, in response to prayers, there's this spiritual warfare going on, and angels fight on behalf of those that are God's and uh, constant activity. And I can't wait to hear more about that in heaven. Remember in Revelation 12, we saw that there will come a day 
when God will say the word and uh, Michael and his angels will be able to whoop Satan and the demons there. So Satan thinks he's on a par with God the Father, but he can't even whoop his fellow angel Michael there. Psalm 34, 7 says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. So I love the verse in Acts that says, David served God's purposes in his generation and then fell asleep. God has a purpose and a plan for everybody that's in this room and also watching online there. He's got a purpose and a plan for your life. And as you're following God's call on your life, you are immortal. It doesn't mean you won't suffer. Lots of suffering in the Bible. This is the time of suffering. Uh, when we're with Jesus forever, there will be no more suffering. So you're not guaranteed it easy, but you are, uh, you are guaranteed that God is protecting you so that you can do exactly what he wants you to do in this lifetime. Well, angels are also instrument of judgment for those who defy God. Isaiah 37, 36 says, The angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. Very... Uh, intriguing verses, but we know that uh, they sometimes are helping like that. And when there is an indescribable victory over an seemingly insurmountable foe, like the troops that had surrounded Jerusalem in that day, many times it's because God hears the prayer of his saints, even though they be few, and dispatches his angels to protect. And he responded to King Hezekiah's humbling himself before the Lord and seeking God's face and the defying words of the enemy, and he did the rest. Now, angels sometimes appear in human form and test believers to see if their love for God really does overflow into their love of people. So Hebrews 13, 1 and 2 says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. <laughs> I wonder how many times a stranger has visited the tabernacle and been an angel in disguise. Since Hebrews says it like that, I would like to believe that even in my, now the sixth year here, we've had times where God sent us a little test. And a visitor to the church that day was really an angel in disguise. I wonder how many times we've passed heaven's test by ministering to that person in that moment and welcoming them and talking with them. And I also wonder how many times we've failed and missed the kind of reward that Hebrews 13 talks about. Well, that's not just for when you're in church. That can be as you go through life and work and school. You never know when an encounter you have with somebody might lead to their salvation because they're a human or might lead to a blessing because God was testing you for rewards purposes. Now, while we're living here, angels protect us, they fight for us and bring us instruction. But when we die, they escort us to the presence of Jesus. I love the little verse, Luke 16, 22. It says, so it was that the beggar died, and that's Lazarus, and his name means God helps. So it was that Lazarus died and was escorted or carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So at the moment of death, when the dear saint of God goes from here to the presence of Christ, at that moment, there's an angelic escort of the soul directly into the presence of the Lord. So powerful to think about. I also read recently that science say something happens at the moment of death, that there's also some kind of light flash in the person's brain. So scientists are now saying something happens at conception, involves a burst of light, something happens at death that concerns a burst of life. And it could it be that the angel who has ministered to the person is going back to heaven for their next assignment. Pretty cool to think about. Well, that just scratches the surface on all the Bible's verses about angels. But today's passage, Revelation 14, where you're turning now, uh, has so many different uh, episodes. There's six or seven more angels that we read about here. And the very first one that we're going to read about uh, is, I think, my favorite passage on angels in the entire Bible when I look at the ramifications of it. So Revelation 14, verse 6 to verse 20. John says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image 
and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he sat on the cloud, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the wine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Angels among us, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. Thank you so much for what we've been in learning in Revelation about how you are in complete control, and you describe to us events in the future as if they had already passed. And Lord, I thank you that the thing we learn over and over again is Things like that you will judge sin. No one on earth is ever going to get away with everything. There is a final reckoning to come. And Revelation builds toward that moment, the return of Christ, his reign on earth, and then the great white throne judgment. But thank you also that we were in Revelation of the multitudinous ways that you get the gospel to people. Through the church, probably before the time of the rapture and the tribulation. Then through the 144,000 witnesses and others witnessing during the time of the tribulation and then even before the final judgment you tell us about some kind of angel flying around the world with the everlasting gospel truly you are not willing that any should perish you want all to come to life thank you for what we read about angels in the scriptures and what we read in this text Lord and I pray that as we think of these things that will give us all the more confidence to witness for you during these troubled days We know the future's in your hands, and we're in your hands, God. And so with confident expectation, we say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, take out the chart from the back of your notes. Those of you who have been through this whole series, every once in a while I come back and give this to you again. So on the back of your notes is the chart that I've got for preaching the book of Revelation here. And you see, when you get to Rev or Revelation 1 through 3, we looked at the age of grace and how Jesus is the Lord of the church. And then in chapters 4 and 5, Revelation gives a look into heaven. And it seems like that with a multitude there from every tribe and tongue, it seems like that those who get saved during this church age are there represented in heaven. And so above that, I've got the word rapture question mark. Revelation doesn't tell us exactly when the rapture happens related to the events of the book of uh, the um, Revelation, but that doesn't stop people from speculating. My own view, as as I have said, is that the rapture is before the time of the tribulation. But uh, some think it's midway or two-thirds of the way or even at the end in conjunction somehow with Christ's second coming. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But then chapters 6 through 19, the biggest portion of the book of Revelation is devoted to the time of the tribulation. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, described it as seven years. The prophets and Jesus and the New Testament and the Revelation describe the first three and a half years being less hard than the very, very difficult and sobering judgments of the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And so it seems like in Revelation 6 when the seals happen and then the trumpet judgments happen in Revelation 8 and 9, the bowls happen that we'll look at next time in Revelation 15 and 16, it seems like those are for sure chronologically unfolding, the bowls, uh, the seals, and then the trumpets, and then the bowl judgments. 
interspersed between those seal judgments and those trumpet judgments and those bowl judgments are other vignettes that Revelation has. And I think everything in there you talk about fitting somewhere during the time of the tribulation and scholars have placed things different places, but that's part of why we've been looking in. And of course, we want to be very humble as we try to put it. And so many times from chapter 6 to 19... You get these vignettes, and it seems to be, again, bringing us all the way up to Christ's return to earth that's going to happen in Revelation 19, and that's how I interpret today's passage as well. For those who are trying to put everything in Revelation 6 through 19, the things in chapters uh, 7 after 6 and before 8 and et cetera with these things, they squeeze it all in in between the judgment times, and I just don't see it unfolding that way. So I think the seals and the trumpets and the bowls are chronological. Everything else you can talk about where it fits somewhere in there as more information is given to us. And sometimes when we tell stories, we tell it that way too. We give an overview, and then we come back and place things in, and that's what this series has been about. Um, Then chapter 19 comes, Christ returns to earth. Chapter 20 All throughout scriptures, there's the expectation that God will reign, Jesus will reign, the Messiah will reign from Jerusalem over a perfect earth that blesses all the nations. Revelation 20 does not stand alone in calling for that time. It's the icing on the cake, so to speak, of expectations that go all the way back to the book of Genesis of being in a perfect land with God without, you know, just as he rules over earth, a nearly perfect earth during that time where the king is among us. And then later in chapter 20, at the end of that time of thousand-year reign of Christ, there's the great white throne judgment, and then eternity future, onto the new earth for believers, onto the lake of fire for those that uh, did not turn to Christ. And so, I interpret chapter 14, the part we're in now, to be once again anticipating the second coming of Christ, just like several of these vignettes have, and getting them out there through this, these encounters with the angels. So, in verses 6 through 12, there's three missionary angels who announce imminent judgment. And I've already told you the first one's my favorite. The first angel, the good news angel, speaks hope to the world in verses 6 and 7. And I just can't help it. Every time I read this verses, I get goosebumps. Because if I am interpreting Revelation rightly, then the church is going to get the gospel to every people group on earth before the rapture. And then during the time of tribulation, the, 140, the two witnesses and the 144,000 witnesses, uh, Jewish witnesses, are going to take the gospel again to every people group. I remember in chapter 7 we saw, who are these? These are the ones coming out of the time of great tribulation. They've obviously turned to Christ, been killed for the faith, and there they are in heaven. So the church gets the gospel to the whole world. During the tribulation, these Jewish witnesses get the gospel to the whole world. And then right before Christ comes back, if I'm reading this rightly... God says, I love them so much. I love that old sinful world so much. One more time. (laughs) You see what it says here? I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, there it is again, to tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. He's really going to come back. He's really going to judge those who don't know the Lord. This is your last chance. Now, we know in this church age, angels may set up the encounter, but we need evangelists, missionaries, everyday Christians sharing the gospel so that people will hear and respond, right? And that presumably is true during the time of the tribulation as well. But finally, the angels are going to get to come out in the open. This one's going to fly around the world and say it's the last chance to turn to Jesus. Isn't that cool to think about? And it's all because God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to life, which is really neat to think about. Well, that angel is followed by the second angel, the bad news angel who speaks reality to the world. So in verse 8, another angel followed. So what follows the, as Christ returns? Well, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, Babylon may be a reference to Rome. It may be a reference to uh, Babylon, the real city rebuilt in the end times. 
But it also clearly is bigger than that. It's the Babylon that represents all that the sinful world loves all the way back uh, to the fall. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, that's what made Adam and Eve fall there in the garden. That's what the uh, pagan worship was built around at the Tower of Babel. They started praying to demonic spirits through praying to the dead and trying to appease the dead and things like that. And throughout the folklore of the world are all these things that tie back into worshiping man and demons rather than worshiping God. And the second angel clearly states that all that the sinful world is trusted in and celebrated in is coming to an end. We're going to see that clearly in Revelation 18. It gets talked about in a powerful way. And in Revelation 18, it say, even says that this judgment on this evil, wicked world system is the direct result of God's people and all the how long prayers, how long until you judge this wicked world system. And in many ways, the entire tribulation is about that purging, but it will be specific at that end that the party is over. That's what the second angel is saying. Babylon's called out for its idolatry, for its immorality. It's anything goes approach that mocked God. And uh, so, last call for the gospel. Judgment's really about to fall. And then the third, this decision angel, calls for a final answer, verses 9 through 12. And it relates back to what we've already read about, uh, the time coming in the tribulation when um, you will need to receive the mark of the beast. We talked about that another time uh, to be able to do commerce in life. And if you don't, life's going to be real hard. And if you turn to Christ in that time and do not uh, you know, get that mark of the beast, uh, many of the folks in that time will turn into a martyr pretty quickly. Um, so it's told in advance, so anyone reading it will know to refuse to compromise and refuse to accept that mark of the beast. So once again in verse 12, we see the choice those who want to go to heaven must make. Faith in Jesus, obedience to his commands, and endurance for him. So look what it says in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, taken together, this will be the last chance those on earth get to repent during that time of tribulation because chapter 15, the bowls are about to be poured out, chapter 15 and 16. Well, that leads to a one-verse interlude, verse 13, where heaven celebrates the death of God's people. Verse 13 says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Now, we can't help it. Nearly 100% of the time, we view death as a bad thing because we're not going to get to see that person anymore. We do everything we can to cling to life and, uh, you know, to medically prolong it. And we're living in a days where technology has allowed that to happen much longer than in previous generations. Our perspective on earth is so limited about what awaits us. But Great thing about the book of Revelation, we often get heaven's view about things going on on earth. And we get that heavenly perspective that we can pray back to God. So as far back as Psalm 116 verse 15, God said, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So we view it as bad and we are going to mourn those who are not here anymore. But heaven says, man, we've been waiting for this guy to get up here. Uh, we just love what he or her, she has done on earth for so long. And now they're up with uh, God in heaven. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Back in 1956, Jim Elliott, along with four other missionaries, were speared to death by the Warani Indians. Now they were called the Aukas, but that means savages. Their tribal name was Warani. Others called them Aukas or savages. And uh, they, upon first encounter those five missionaries, they were trying to love these people and get the gospel to them. They landed on a helicopter on a beach, and immediately the scared natives speared them to death. And Life magazine ran pictures of their body with the caption, Why this waste? We can't help it. That's what we do. Why this waste? Why these young people? Uh, they're in their 20s and 30s that had given their hearts and lives to go be missionaries. Why would this happen to them? Why this waste? But the story was different in heaven. They were welcomed to heaven and perhaps even as we saw about the 144,000 having a song sang to them, maybe a song was sang to the missionaries as they got home, a song of celebration of the gospel and those who sacrificed to get it to people. And God looked down and he said, because of this sacrifice, I'm going to save the whole tribe. Now, if you'd gone back to Wheaton College and asked young Jim Elliott 
what he wanted to do with his life, he would have said, I want to go down and reach that tribe there in uh, Peru, in that country. I want to go down there in Ecuador and Peru, Peru and reach those people. And uh, I'm willing to give my life. That's what we say, right? I'm willing to give my life to reach that people over there. What he imagined was a long, fruitful ministry that transpired over the decades and then being able to look back and see his efforts having led many of the people. In God's economy, the best way to accomplish that for that people was to have them become martyrs at first contact. Well, his wife and others took the gospel back there and the, uh, some of the ones that speared him, him to death later became elders in that village. Uh, and among those people and have shared their story worldwide now. And uh, when they made it to heaven, they rested, but they have also been able to see their works over the years as the next tribal member gets, got saved, that next indigenous person got saved, and joined them in heaven as the years have passed. You know, this blessing, John's the one that received this right from the hand of the Lord through angels, and you know, when John the Apostle wrote this in verse 13, it must have meant so much to him. He had seen his own brother James killed for the faith. He had seen his fellow apostles martyred for the faith. And he was the last among the original ones that were still alive. They were resting and their converts would follow them to glory. And that's true of those who witness in all generations. God has his purpose and plan for you and you are immortal until he calls you home. Heaven celebrates the death of God's people. I love this vignette right there that encourages the saints of any generation. Well, we've seen three angels. We've got three more to look at. Verses 14 through 20, there's three more angels who will implement judgment. And again, I told you this passage anticipates the second coming of Christ and the battle of Armageddon we're going to read more about in chapter 16 through 19. Immediately after this chapter, the bold judgments are poured out. And the way I view these things is it will be rapid succession. Uh, I believe uh, there are some people that place the seal and the trumpet judgments all in the first three and a half years and then just these bowls in the second half. I tend to think that the opening of the first seal... Uh, through those four first seals will be will take us into and past the time of the three and a half years into the second part and so I've got uh, the majority of the seals bowl uh, trumpet judgments and bowls happening in that very great tribulation it's called those last three and a half years um, so I think it'll be by the time you get to the bowls I think we're talking about days weeks months not at this point years um, so, this first angel is a guardian angel who appeals from the earth's temple, question mark. It says in verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. That's a reference to Jesus. Having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. Verse 15, Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he has sat on the cloud, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So this other angel in verse 15 seems to be at the earthly temple. He's been watching the Antichrist desecrate the temple. In disgust, this angel appeals for Jesus to bring down the sickle representing judgment. Because if the judgment doesn't happen, we can't go on to the Messiah reigning on earth. And so it's anticipation. So judgment will happen, and then God will reign on earth. Way back in the 6th century... A great saint said, that he has a sickle in his hand signifies that the consummation of the age rests in his power. So what this angel appeals for from earth is guided by heaven's perspective that judgment needs to come to right every wrong. The great Adrian Rogers used to say, every sin is going to get dealt with one of two places, at the cross or the great white throne judgment. On the cross for those who believe, Jesus takes our punishment but for those that don't, they're awaiting a court date, the great white throne judgment to come. So heaven anticipates that time coming and the judgments that need to happen to make it happen. And our prayers need to be guided just like the saints of old for God's will to be done in such a way. Well, secondly, there's a judgment angel that appears from the heavenly temple, verses 17 through 20. We read that. 
And this angel appears to be part of getting heaven ready for the battle of Armageddon that we're going to see described in the chapters to come. He has a sharp sickle in his hand. He's ready to harvest the earth. And this harvest language makes us think of the parables Jesus told, including Matthew 13, the wheat and the tares that Bailey Smith used to speak about when he was here and how he described the harvest at the end of the age. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 13 spoke of the end of the age and reaper angels gathering tares representing the wicked away from the wheat. Well, here's how it appears. Matthew 13, we're going to put it up here for you, verses 41 through 43. The Son of Man, that's Jesus, will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And that pretty much squares with the flow of Jesus' Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation. There's judgment of all evildoers when Christ returns. The wicked are taken away from the righteous and the righteous are left to enter the millennial kingdom. John sees not wheat and tares like Jesus had talked about. John was there that day when Jesus told that parable. But he sees grapes ripe for harvesting. And the connection there makes me at least think of the bloody judgment of the battle of Armageddon when those that try to defy Christ are defeated by him and blood flows and flows and flows. Zechariah the prophet said it would flow. Uh, Revelation really talks about it flowing, including in our verses 19 and 20. Well, third, there's a fire angel that appeals from, is this again from Earth's temple, verses 18 through 20? And this may be another angel centered at the earthly temple of the time. And it could be he's driven by the prayers he has heard prayed at that altar. Let's read it again, verse 18. Another angel came out from the altar at power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who has the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Whew! So he appeals for the next thing to happen. Now let me be fair. We're using harvest language here. And another way to take these two different harvests is the mid-tribulational rapture view that believes the rapture will be at the midpoint of the tribulation. Or the pre-wrath rapture view that's about two-thirds of the way of the tribulation. tribulation. I've already told you I think it happens before the tribulation, the pre-tribulational rapture view. I did that based on verses like Revelation 3.10 that says, Because you've kept my command to endure, I also will keep you from the hour of testing that's going to come over the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Or 1 Thessalonians 5.9 that says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we will not experience God's wrath, the key question becomes when God's wrath begins related to the tribulation. So here's what the argument's really about. When, does, when is it God's wrath? When is it just man and Satan's wrath? Man's mismanagement and Satan using that. When does it become God's wrath? I think the way the text unfolds and the way the scripture unfolds, uh, when the very first seal is opened in Revelation 6, it's God initiating the years of wrath before he returns to earth. Uh, others say, no, no, uh, that happens at the midpoint or the two-thirds point, and so thus the mid-tribulational rapture view, the pre-wrath raptural view. What they say is that up until now in Revelation, it's been a time of tribulation passively allowed by God, but with the bowls, it will be a time of God's wrath being actively poured out. So in those views, the rapture's happening here. Uh, when Jesus is harvesting the grapes in these verses and the other angel is gathering the remaining wicked in verses 19 to 20 to be put down at the battle of Armageddon. Now, let me just say, there are great scholars that believe that the saints, Christian saints of this church age will go through part or two-thirds or all of the tribulation. And uh, so we are heavily influenced in our area by the wonderful professors of Liberty University. In my own study, I also believe the rapture will be before the time of the tribulation. But I've got lots of friends that believe some of these other views, and so I want to remain humble even as I present to you guys. Because one thing no saint should have is a hope that they won't go through the time of tribulation because tribulation's hard and hard is bad and I want to avoid bad. God wouldn't want us to go through bad. Well, tell that to the saints currently living in Nigeria 
or Pakistan uh, or China. Uh, you know, in other words, for 2,000 years, Christians have experienced lots of tribulation, lots of trouble, lots of hardship. Many have been killed for the faith and gone right to be with Jesus. During the days of the Roman Empire, during the days John's writing, he'd seen it. He'd experienced the death of his friends through tribulation and trouble. So uh, that can't be your expectation. And we know that God is faithful. And if indeed we do go through part or two-thirds or all of the tribulation, God will be with us. And if you get killed for the faith during that time, guess what happens to you immediately? The presence of God in heaven and everybody you know that's already there. So you'll be okay, right? And so I want to make that clear because I know that many of my mid-tribulational friends or pre-wrath view friends or others are concerned that too many, that, that if, if they're right and I'm wrong, uh, they think, man, the Christians of America and the world are not being prepared for this terrible time that they may very well have to endure. So that's why I wanted to go ahead and talk to you about it that way. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being firm doctrinal conviction, I am a 10 in bring premillennial. When we talk about the millennium, that's Revelation 20, the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, anticipating all that the prophets talked about a time and I am a 10 that that time will come. There will be a literal thousand-year reign of Christ on earth we call the millennium. Almost everybody that interprets the Bible literally believes that. So this rapture uh, discussion is a separate one within premillennialism. If you don't believe there will be a reign of Christ on earth and you simply believe we're going to go to heaven and that's all there is after this earth, not a new earth, if that, then you're not even talking about rapture language much at all. Um, but on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm a 6 or 7 that the rapture will be before the tribulation. It's an issue we need to be humble about. Um, now, when I preached this in 2008, I was a 5 or 6. So my conviction from what I've read and studied throughout the scriptures has even grown stronger that we will be raptured before the time of the tribulation. But if we do wind up going through part or all of it, our focus just needs to be on what it's supposed to be on anyway being a faithful and fruitful follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now let's get back to the larger point. Look at verses 19 and 20. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city. Blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. So what these verses tell us is that there is a day of reckoning coming for those who would try to destroy God's people, particularly Israel. One day, the blood of those who would do Israel, God's saints, harm, will flow in the promised land. And uh, there's so many things that anticipate that Old Testament, New Testament as well. But I hope the president of Iran, who hates Israel, is listening to this. You know, there was another Persian, Iranian, once upon a time, named Haman during the days of Esther. And he created a gallows so he could hang Mordecai on them, but God flipped it around and he hung on the gallows he erected for Mordecai. And for those that would do Israel harm, again, uh, you, to understand what's happened in the book of Revelation, you've got to know Jesus. Uh, you've got to have a focal point of Jesus. He's the spirit of prophecy. And you also have to understand the hope and expectation of Israel of uh, being restored and, and the Messiah reigning from them. On earth, God's people are mocked, but heaven celebrates what the hell-bound mock. Now, last time I told you about the conversion of St. Augustine. One day, St. Augustine was approached by a woman uh, who had been one of his mistresses before his conversion. And he saw her, and he's like, oh, that was my old days. And he turned and started to walk away quickly. And she said, Augustine, Augustine, it's me. And he quickened his pace and he called over his shoulder, Yes, I know, but it's no longer me. <laughs> when the hellbound crowd you used to run with tries to get you to sin or to mock you for following Jesus, here's what you say. That's who I was. It's not who I am. Join with me in following Christ and fleeing the wrath to come because there's a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shun. You take your stand for Christ, whatever the future holds. Angels are going to minister to you until you've served God's purpose in your generation. Then they'll escort you to heaven. Let me show you one more angel passage, and then we'll bow our heads. Luke 12, 8 and 9. Jesus says, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, 
Him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. In Matthew's passage, the parallel passage to this one in Luke, he includes that whoever confesses me before the heavenly Father, I'll confess. Uh, whoever, I'll confess before the Father. You confess me, I'll conf- you confess me before men now, I'll confess you before the Father. And we read here the angels one day. But if you deny me before the Father... And before men now, I'll deny you before the Father and the angels on that day. Go ahead and bow your heads. So for Christians listening to me now, let me just urge you to be 100% committed to persevering in your faith no matter what comes. You don't know all that you're going to face, but you know God, and he's with you. These are days where your lost loved ones, your lost neighbors, this lost world doesn't need you to shrink back. It needs you to boldly share your testimony that the only hope you have for going to heaven is that Jesus saved you, a sorry sinner. And you need to tell them if you'll provide a sorry sinner, if you'll provide the sorry sinner, we'll provide the Savior. So you want to talk to them about turning to Christ and do it boldly. Don't shrink back from that. God will be with you. And during this time of invitation, you might want to just come to the altar and pray for boldness this week and sharing with that person you've been reluctant to share with. Or you might be facing a sin and you're right on the fence and you're struggling with uh, being all out for God when this world has so many things that allure you. you. You have your own mark of the beast right now to turn away from worldliness and instead give it all to Jesus. And you might want me to pray with you about something. You might want to come up here for that. And then if you're here today and don't know the Lord, but God's been drawing you through this message and through other things happening in your life to turn to Christ for salvation, I want to give you a sinner's prayer so that you can say directly to the Lord now. And if you, with humility in your heart, recognize your need of a Savior and your total inability to save yourself, and you'll turn to Jesus He'll save you. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the death, you will, dead, you will be saved. And so in your heart you need to believe and you need to confess him before men. That's what baptism is all about. You first receive Christ. He gives you that eternal life. And then you confess him before men. If you'd like to receive Christ now, say a prayer something like this in the quietness of your heart directly to the Lord. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and my sins do deserve judgment. I believe that. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me anyway, for dying for my sins on the cross, for rising from the dead. I believe. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I turn to you now. I'm sick of me. I want you in my life. I want to live my life for your glory. Show me what that looks like in these days ahead. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Will you stand now and you might want to come and tell me and everyone, I've turned to Christ this morning. I want to follow him. Any other decision you have, we can be here for that as well. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee
the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory, that song. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Is, is there somebody that's supposed to do a presentation right now? I know Joey uh, was delayed at the bus station, um, and I see bags up here, and I think I know what it's for, but we might have to wait till next week unless somebody rushes the stage now uh, to help with that. Um, and uh, I'm guessing it was Joey and the train delay uh, cost him there. Okay, enough talking by me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love and this service we've had, Lord God. We love you, and we're so thankful for you and your salvation you provide in Christ. And Lord, I thank you for that inspiring image. We, we've already studied some of the uh, second coming of Christ and the battle of Armageddon and the reign of Christ to follow, but here we get in this chapter this amazing picture of your love for sinners is so great that even before the second coming of Christ, somehow an angel flies around the world saying one more time, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son Jesus that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you so much for that. And may we be the ones who get the message out now. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, folks, thanks again for tuning in. Your time and attention were so very much appreciated, and we pray that this service was a blessing to you. This live stream will soon be available on our social media platforms, including our Facebook page at the Tabernacle Family and our YouTube channel, The Tabernacle Today. The sermon from this service will also soon be posted on your podcast platforms at The Tabernacle Today, as well as on our website, www.thetabernaclefamily.org, and our mobile app. If you're searching for a church home, we would love for you to join our church family. Also, I want you to know that God has a purpose and plan for your life. And if we can help you grow in any way, feel free to contact us by visiting us in person, calling our church office, sending us an email or text, or by visiting our social media platforms where you can find plenty of online resources. We want to help you grow in any and every way possible. God bless you this week, and we hope to see you soon. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you.